ओके ग्रेट थैंक थैंक यू वेरी मच शारदा ओके सो लेट अस बिगिन टू डेज ट्यूटोरियल सेशन सो दिस इज द फिफ्थ ट्यूटोरियल सेशन ऑफ द कोर्स ऑफ दिस प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग सेशन वेयर वी टॉक अबाउट कैलकुलस ऑफ मॉन्डियल वेरिएबल व्हिच इज द कोर्स ऑफ दिस प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग सेशन एंड इन टुडेस वीडियो आई विल सॉल्व द वीक 5 असाइनमेंट्स सो लेट अस बिगिन विद प्रॉब्लम नंबर 1 okay so what is the problem say the problem say that let p be a partition of interval 0 to 2 then what is the norm of p so and p is given by 0 0.6 1.2 1.5 1.8 1.95 1 and 2 so how is the norm defined that is the supremum of x minus Uh, x i minus x i minus one. So we can denote these elements here as x zero. This as x one. This as x two. This as x three. This as x four. And similarly, x five and x six. Okay. So. <clears throat> For x i belonging to P, and I will start from one to six. So I goes from one to six. So let us uh, calculate all the elements. So for i equal to one, this will be x one minus. I'm sorry. This will be x one minus x zero. That is point six minus zero, which is point six again. For i equal to two, x two minus x one is one point two minus point six, which is again point six. For i equal to three, this is one point five minus one point two, zero point three. Similarly, for i equal to four. This will be point three. I equal to five. This will be zero point one five, and I equal to six will be zero point zero five. Okay, so here it is. 1.95 minus 1.8, and here, here it is 2 minus 1.95. So we have to take the supremum of all these elements, so which is basically the maximum value, or we can say it like this. That is zero point six. So this is our answer. Okay. So now let us check. We can see that the third one matches our answer. So this is the.
Okay, so now I will move to the second problem. Which is asking uh, to calculate this summation. So the summation is for k equal to 1 to n the sum of a square and we have to find the correct answer. So you all of you might know the formula. So the correct answer is n into n plus 1 times 2 n plus 1 by 6. And uh, you can verify this by taking n equal to 2. So for that, this summation will be k square equal to 1 plus 2 square, 1 square plus 2 square, which is equal to basically 5. And you can see, uh, we can eliminate all the options here. So let me write out what will be the values for n equal to 2 for these given options. So 2 times 3 by 2. So this becomes, let me, let me write it here, for n equal to 2 n into n plus 1 by 2 becomes 2 times 3 over 2. So this is 3. n times n plus 1 times n minus 1 by 6 becomes 2 times 3 times 1 by 2, which is again 3. n times 2n plus 1 by 2 becomes 5 and 4 this also becomes 5 so this is 2 times 3 times 5 over 6 so this also becomes 5 and this is 2 times 5 over 2 this also becomes 5 so we can see that automatically these two are incorrect only these two are left so this is not equal to 5 which should be the answer and this is also not equal to 5 which should be the answer and to eliminate one of these let us take n equal to 3 then summation of k1 to n k square will be 1 plus 4 plus 9 that will be 14 and you can see n into 2n plus 1 by 2 will be 3 times 7 by 2 which is 21 by 2 so this is not equal to 14 but the fourth option, which is n into n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 by 6, this will be 3 times 4 times 7 by 6, and 6 cancel out, so it will, this becomes 14. So we can eliminate this one also, and we can see that this is the correct option. But let us prove it uh, in a general way. So let me do this. So we got the correct answer to be n into n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 by 6. And let us denote the summation by p, p of n. Okay. So let us denote this as p of n. So now we want to prove it for a general case and we will use induction method here, which assumes that if for summation of 1 to n k square 
the summation is given by pn pn then then if we increase uh, if we add another term so that the summation goes from n plus n to n plus 1 to n n plus 1 this will be given by pn plus 1 so that is basically the induction method how we prove it and we can check it for small values of n 1 to 3 which you have already done uh, when we are we were eliminating all the options okay so now we have to prove that if p n plus 1 is then p n is this then p n plus 1 which is p n plus n plus 1 whole square that will give the result like this p n plus 1 n plus 1 plus 1 2 times n plus 1 plus 1 by 6 so this will be n plus 1 n plus 2 2 n plus 3 by 6 so i hope you understand the argument here so we are basically assuming that for when for when the summation is up to n terms then this formula is correct and if that is correct then for n plus 1 terms that will also have to be correct so we can start from here let us denote it as 1 so from 1 we will deduce formula number 2 okay so from 1 what we have we have pn of 1 is equal to pn plus n plus 1 whole square how we are getting this because pn of 1 is summation i 1 to n k square sorry 1 to n plus 1 so you can write it as i 1 to n k square plus the last term which is n plus 1 square and now this one is the first term here is nothing but p of n so that's what, what we have basically written so we can write this in terms of the formula that we have assumed to be true and this will be the result now let us simplify this okay so i ran out of space let me quickly add one page here okay so now we have to simplify this so p of n plus 1 then will be given by we can take n plus 1 common from both the terms and we will be left with n times 2n plus 1 over 6 plus n plus 1 and that will be n plus 1 let us take out the 6 here and it will become 2n square plus n plus 6n plus 6 this is n plus 1 over 6 times 2n square plus 7n plus 6 now we can factorize this and we will see that this is nothing but equal to what we have here is n plus 2 times 2n plus 3 we can quickly do the multiplication here so it becomes 2n square plus 4n then 3n plus 6 so 2n square plus 7n plus 6 so we can write it as n plus 1 2n plus 3 n plus 2 over 6 so by method of induction we prove that summation of i equal to 1 to n k square is given by uh, 
by 6. Okay. So this is the proof and this is also the answer of this question. Okay. So I hope you have uh, followed it and understood the logic. So for method of inter induction, what we do is we assume that for, uh, for n, this is formula is true. And then we check that if for n is true, then for n plus 1 is also true. So by that logic, we say that this is the correct answer. And we have also seen by elimination that this is correct. Okay. So if you guys have understood it, then all right. And if you have any question, then please let me know in the chat box. Otherwise, I'll move to the next problem. Okay. So I will keep it here. So if you have any question, uh, let me know in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask. Okay, I think everyone understood it correctly. So since there aren't any questions, I will move to the next problem, which is problem number three. And the problem statement is that we have defined a partition here. Sorry, let me write it here. And a function is defined fx as 1 plus x squared and in the interval 0 to 1 we have to find ufp minus lfp okay so we know how these are defined so this is a summation mi xi minus xi minus 1 where we iterate over i and how we got mi mi is the maximum of fx for when x take x takes these two values so what is the maximum of fx that is given by mi Similarly, the other term can be calculated like this, where small m subscript i is the minimum of fx for the values we are take, taking. Okay. And uh, let us quickly also see how this function will look like. So, say this is 0, 0, this is 1, this is 2, this is 1, this is 2. So, our function will look like this at 0, this is 1 plus 0 square, so this is 1, and at 1, this this is two and our points those are, that are given are within this interval okay so now this is a bit tedious but let us calculate this ufp and lfps okay so for i equal to one what will be the value of mi so let us do it for one or two values, then I will write, uh, write the values of mi and uh, those things uh, just uh, without doing any calculation. So for i equal to 1, m1 will be the maximum of fx for x in the region. 0 to 0.2, 0 to 0.2, okay. So we can see that the function that we have got here, this is increasing always. 
right so that means the maximum of fx will be for will be for the value of x for the value of x max well that is uh, in the interval that we are checking uh, the upper bound of that interval that will have that we, that we are de defining as x max and max of fx in that interval is obtained like this okay so for example if we are looking at the interval from 0 to 0.2 suppose here it is 0.2 if you are looking at there then you can see that at 0 f of x equal to 0 that is 1 but f of x equal to 0.2 that is 1 plus 0 0.04 so f of 0.2 is greater than f of 0 so that f of 0.2 takes the value of mi okay i hope this is clear to all of you so let me write the first term here so it will be 1 plus it will be 1 plus 0.2 square this is just f of 0.2 times 0.2 minus 0 okay similarly what will be the second term 1 plus 0.4 square times 0.4 minus 0.2 okay here also uh, we are looking at the interval 0.2 to 0.4 and for that the maximum of fx occurs for the value of x equal to 0.4 similarly we can write out the other terms 0.6 minus 0.4 and we can see that this multiplicative factor xi minus xi minus 1 is 0.2 always because the points that we are considering here are evenly spaced so we can write it as 0.2 here again and the last term will be times 0.2 okay so we can simplify it a bit 0.2 times f of 0.2 f of 0.4 f of 0.6 f of 0.8 and f of 1 so that is one of the parameter which you have to evaluate now we can do the similar thing and with similar logic we can also find this l of xp and here we have to find the mi parameters which is minimum of fx in the interval that we are looking so again we go back to the plot of fx and we see that minimum will happen for the lower bound of the interval that we are getting right so here we can say with analogy to this one for i equal to one we can say that mi will be f0 since f0 is smaller than f of 0.2 right so here we can write out all the terms one by one so the first term again will be one plus one plus zero square because here we are taking the minimum times again 0 0.2 minus zero one plus 0 0.2 square times 0 0.4 minus 0 0.2 and we can again see that xi minus xi minus one is basically 0.2 
So the multiplicative part is constant and we can write out the other terms similarly. Times 0 0.2, 1 plus 0.6 square times 0 0.2, 1 plus 0.8 square times 0 0.2. Okay. And like this also, we can simplify it a bit by writing this like this. So 0 0.2 times this will be f of 0 plus f of 0 0.2 plus f of 0 0.4 plus f of 0 0.6 plus f of 0 0.8. So let us turn this as equation 2. So what you have to calculate? You have to calculate u. Let me use a different color for this. So from 1 and 2, we, we get that UFP minus LFP is nothing but 0.2. We can take common in both, both of them. So let me quickly show. So 0.2 in both of them, we can take common. And here, we'll have the other terms. So F point two plus F of point four plus F of point six plus F of point eight plus F of one. And then, then we have to subtract this term. So this is F of zero plus F of point two plus F of point four plus F of point six plus F of point eight and all this will have negative sign okay so we can clearly see here that these terms will get cancelled out what will be left with is 0 0.2 times f of 1 minus f of 0 and we have already calculated the value of f of 1 and f of 0 so f of 1 is 2 and f of 0 is 1 so this becomes 0.2 and we can write it in this form also. So u of fp minus l of fp is given by 0.2 or 1 by 5. So let us now check the options given and with them we can see that the first option is the one which is matching with, matching with our answer. So this is the correct answer. Okay. So this is our answer. Let me put a box here. OK, so this was our problem number three of this tutorial session. So please let me know if you have any problem understanding this or if you have any other questions. I will wait for a few moment uh, for questions and then I'll move to the next problem. If you have any questions, you can also let me know in the chat box. That is also fine. I am constantly monitoring for messages. Okay, so I think there are no questions here. So let me move to the next problem, which is problem number four. Okay. So here the problem states that let P be set of all partitions in the interval A to B, and F is a function defined there, then for any partition. P1 belonging to P, we can say that UF of P1 is one of the
upper bound of the set LFP such that E belongs to P, uh, this defined P, okay? So, what L and UFP are, we have already discussed in the previous problem, how to calculate those. So, Okay. So now we will use a small property here that says for any partition P1 and P2 of the same, defending the same interval, we always have L of FP1 F P2, okay? This is for all or let me write it like this, for all P1, P2 belonging to P. Now, let us fix this P, okay? Let us fix P2. And if that is fixed, then UF of P2 will give a number just okay so let us denote that number as m okay and if we follow from here we we'll see that l of fp1 is less than equal to m for p1 belonging to p for any p1 and the catch is to observe here that P1 can be any partition which is taken from this set of all the partitions possible. So if we take the supremum value of LP1 considering all the sets uh, all the partitions P1 that is uh, derived from the set, this equation will still hold, right? And M is defined here. Okay, so if the supremum is supremum of this uh, set of uh, LFP1 is less than M, then it is clear that M is an upper bound of This, how this is clear? Because we have already gone through the definition of bounded sets and those things. And if there exists any number which is greater than all the values of the, uh, all the elements of the set, then it is defined as one of the upper, upper bound. And here L F of P1 for any P1 that is uh, available here, is smaller than this m sorry smaller than this 
m number that we are getting so basically m is an upper bound now let us again see what was m m was defined as nothing but uf of p2 right this was for any p2 belonging to p okay Okay, so this is our answer, which is basically stating that the statement here is true. So this is the correct one. Okay, so I hope you followed uh, the logic here, how to derive this. And if you guys have any questions, please let me know in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask me. Otherwise, I'll move to the problem number five. Okay, so I don't think there are any questions. So let me move to the next problem, which is problem number five here. So which is the basically we have to check whether this function is remain integrable in the interval or not so this is a very simple problem so there is one necessary condition for Riemann integ integrability checking and that is that the function that we are checking has to be bounded. Has to be bounded. Okay. So now if we plot the function here, is uh, let me draw a coordinate system all right so let me draw the function fx equal to one over x square. So you will see that when x is becoming zero, this function is blowing up, right? So this is x equal to zero. So for x equal to zero, if x is not defined, and so this is point number one and point number two is 
f x is unbounded in the neighborhood of x equal to zero because here you can take you cannot define a number m which is greater than all the values possible because this is blowing up at x equal to zero so by definition this function is not remain integrable so let us do the limits here this is plus one this is minus one okay so not remain integrable okay so is there any doubt for this problem if there are any doubts then please let me know in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask otherwise i'll move to the problem number six Okay, sorry, I marked it in a wrong way. So false is the correct answer. So let me write it explicitly here that the statement given is false. this is our answer okay so is there any doubt if not then i'll move to the next problem okay i don't see any questions so i will then move to the problem number six And the problem here states that let f be a remain integrable function. So the function is integrable. Then we are given information that f a equal to f b equal to one. And then we have to find the value of a to b f prime t dt okay so since f prime t is given here we will automatically assume that the function is differentiable and this is defined as ddt of ft okay and this is find in the region a to b since we are given an integration in that region we will automatically assume that this is true so now what will happen if you integrate f prime t dt if it is an indefinite integral you will get ft plus some constant right and if there are limits suppose from a0 to a1 will the integration will be for t equal to a0 to t equal to a1 a1 so it, it will basically be f a1 minus f a0 now let us tackle this problem here so we are basically given the same integration. So what is i? i is integration from a to b. And we are sure that in this region it is integrable. Then f prime t dt is given by nothing but ft evaluated at t equal to a to b and b. So this will be given by f of b minus f of a. Now the value of these two parameters are given. We have 
both of them as one. So this will be one minus one, which is equal to zero. So what we get is that the value of this integration i given by integration from a to b f prime t dt is zero. So zero is the correct answer for this question. So let me put a box around the answer. So this is the answer and let us see the given options here and we can clearly see that the last option is the one that is matching with our answer. So this is the correct option. Okay. So any doubt in this problem? If not, then I will move to the next problem. Okay, I don't see any questions here. So let me move to the problem number seven. Okay. So here we are given an integration which is from 0 to 1, 1 over 1 minus x to the power alpha dx. And we have to say that this uh, integration does not exist finitely for which values of alpha. Okay. So what does it mean that it does not exist finally, uh, finitely that uh, if we evaluate this integral for some values of alpha, the integral int integration will blow up. So let me write it in a different way. This will be from zero to one, one minus x minus alpha dx. And let us do a very little substitution here. Let us assume that y is one minus x. Then dx will be minus dy. And the limits of this integration will also get changed. So when x equal to zero, then y will be one. When x equal to one, y will be 0, right? So let us denote the integration as i. i will be from 0 to 1, 1 minus x minus alpha dx. And it can be written as minus of 1 to 0, y to the power minus alpha dy, which is basically 0 to 1, y to the power minus alpha dy. And we can easily do this integration. This will be one minus alpha y to the power one minus alpha by one minus alpha evaluated at zero to one. So we can take one minus alpha common and this will be y to the power this. This will be 1 to the power 1 minus alpha minus 0 to the power 1 minus alpha. So that is the value of the integration. This will be 1 minus 0 to the power 1 minus alpha. Now we can clearly see that when alpha equal to 1, then this term here, which is multiplicative 1 over 1 minus alpha, this will become 1 over 0 and this the value of i will blow up. So for alpha equal to 1, this integration does not exist. Similarly, for alpha greater than 1, 0 to the power 1 minus alpha will imply something like 0 to the power 1 over 0 to the power k, where k is greater than 0. Right. Why? Because alpha is greater than 1. That means 1 minus alpha is less than 0. So we can say that k equal to alpha minus 1 is greater than 0. And that is what we are getting here, basically. So this also has the form of 1 over 0, which is diverges. So for alpha greater than one, that the integration again vanishes. So 
for these values of alpha are not permitted. So we see that for alpha greater than or equal to one, if we merge the two conditions, i is not finite, right? So the correct answer will be this one, which is matching with our answer. So this is the correct. option okay and this alpha equal to one possibility that can be also seen from another perspective so we can write the integration here from 0 to 1 y to the power minus alpha dy for alpha equal to 1 this integration becomes like this i equal to 0 to 1 dy over y so this is log of y from 0 to 1, so 0 minus ln 0. Again, this term goes up. So from this also, we can see that alpha equal to 1 is not a valid condition. And, and actually, this is the correct way of doing the integration for alpha equal to 1. Okay, so we can see that uh, this is our answer that for alpha greater than or equal to one, the integration does not exist finitely. So this is our answer. So please let me know if there are any questions. If there aren't any questions, I'll move to the last few, last three problems. Okay, I don't see any questions now. So I'll move to the last problem. Which is problem number eight. Okay. Which says that for any two sets A and B, when A plus B is defined as A plus B for A belonging to A and B belonging to B. So we have two sets A, B and A plus B is defined such that A is belonging to A and B is belonging to B. Okay, then we have to say which of these conditions are true. And we can clearly see which is the correct answer by taking some example. So let us say that A is set in the closed interval zero to one and B is the set in the closed interval two to three. Okay, then what will be the A plus B set? This will be like adding every element possible in A to every element possible in B. So since these are both closed interval, the set A plus B will, will also be a closed interval. And what is the minimum value that will be here that will be present? That is when we calculate, when we sum the minimum of both. So this will be from two, the A plus B will start from two and what will be the maximum? That is when we sum both of the maximum or supremum values of set A and B. So two to four, right? So we will take this example where A is defined like this, B is defined like this and following this definition, a plus B is defined like this. Now let us quickly see what is the supremum of A. It is one. Supremum of B is three. Supremum of A plus B is four. Similarly, infimum of A is zero. Infimum of B is two. And infimum of A plus B is again true. Okay. So we can check one by one the options given and see which one is correct. So
so first let us see that supreme of of a plus b is equal to supreme of a minus supreme of b and we can clearly see that for the example that we have taken this is not true because this is 4 and 4 is not equal to 1 minus 3 which is minus 2 so option 1 is incorrect what is the second option here the second option is A plus B is maximum of supremum of A or supremum of B, and we can see that this is again not true as this is four, but max of one or three is three, so four not equal to three. That means the second option given that is also incorrect. Okay. Similarly, let us check the third option here. That is, infimum of a plus b is equal to minimum of these two values, and we can clearly see that two is not equal to minimum of. Zero or two. That is, two is not equal to zero. So the third option is also incorrect. We are only left with the last option, and I can say now that it is correct, and we will shortly see why this is. So this is the correct answer. So let us also check the fourth possibility. That is, infimum of a plus b is equal to Infimum of a plus infimum of b, and for the examples that we have taken, we can easily calculate it. So here it is. Infimum of a plus b is two, and infimum of a is zero. Infimum of b is two. So you can see that this is giving two equal to two, which is true. that means the option number 4 is the correct one so option 4 is correct so this is the correct option okay so i hope you have uh, understood it correctly here so quickly write it a bit clearly okay so if you guys have any doubt please let me know otherwise i'll move to problem number 9 again uh, like i have always said that you can always always ask me questions in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask questions whichever is suitable for you so okay so there are no questions here so let me move to the next problem which is problem number 9 so here it is asked what is the average value of the function fx sin x in the interval 0 to pi so we know how sin x function looks at uh, let me draw the line a bit more straight so this is sin x this is x uh, it will peak at x equal to pi by 2 x equal to pi this will be zero x at x equal to zero this will also be zero okay so now average of of function fx in the interval 0 to pi is defined as 
pi minus 0 integration from 0 to pi fx dx. So for any general function fx, the average of the function in the interval a to b is defined as integration b minus uh, integration times 1 over b minus a fx dx the integration is from a to b okay and here for this function fx if we put b equal to a equal to 0 and b equal to pi we'll end up with this form here so this is nothing but 1 over pi 0 to pi sin x dx so what is the integration of sin x that is minus cos x and it is evaluated at 0 to pi so this becomes 1 over pi cos pi minus cos 0 times minus 1 because there is a minus term here so what will be this we know cos pi is minus 1 and cos 0 is 1 so we can use these values here minus 1 minus sorry cos 0 is not 0 cos 0 is 1 minus 1 times minus 1 so this will become 2 over pi so average of sin x from 0 to pi is equal to 2 over pi so this is the correct answer and let us check the options which are given here so you can see that the second option matches with our answers and this is the correct option also okay so I can probably quickly draw the cos x function here also. Cos x, so this is 0, this is minus 1, and suppose this is 1. So at x equal to 0, this is 1. At x equal to pi by 2, cos becomes 0, and at x equal to pi cos x is minus 1 so it looks like this okay so if there is any question for or any doubt for the problem number 9 please let me know in the chat box <coughs> sorry if there aren't any question then i will move to the last problem of today's discussion Okay, I don't think there are any questions, so we can move to the last problem, which is just asking to calculate an interval. Okay, sorry, do an integration in this integral of sec x squared in the interval 0 to pi by 3. So the problem is to calculate the integral i 0 to pi by 3 sec squared dx. So this is a pretty simple integration. We know that integration of x squared dx is equal to 10x plus c because dx of dx of 10x is x squared x okay so we can do this and write this as 
tan x evaluated at x equal to 0 to x equal to 5 by 3 and pi by 3 is nothing but 60 degree and we know tan pi by 3 is root 3. So this integration becomes just tan pi by 3 minus tan 0 which is root 3. So this is the answer of this integration and if you look at the options you see that the third option is the one matching with our answer and this is also the correct option. So if you guys have any doubt here, you can ask me or I can show you very briefly why this is true. Ddx of 10x, we can write off that is that Ddx of cos x times or we can simply do it like this sin x by cos x we can write 10 x like this and we can use the chain rule here by writing it sin x times cos x inverse and then this will become sin x times cos x to the power minus 2 again then there will be a for chain rule there will be another differentiation there will be a minus sign coming and there will be another sin x so this will become sin squared x and the second term will be cos x of sin x to the x of sin x which will just become cos x Okay, so here I just quickly shown how to obtain this relation that ZDX of 10x is x squared x. You guys might be familiar with this because this is simple high school stuff. So if you have any problem for uh, having question for problem number 10, please let me know in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask. Then we are already completed the last problem. If there are any question, then we'll conclude this meeting here. Okay. Sir, can you explain yeah. last part of eighth question? Sorry, seventh question. Uh, oh, which problem you are talking about? Integral 0 to 1, 1 by 1 minus x the whole raised to alpha dx does not exist finitely for. Okay, so you're talking about problem number 7, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So you want to talk, uh, understand this part, right? For yes, alpha sir. equal to alpha equal to 1. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So for alpha equal to 1, what will be the integration? Our integration was from 0 to 1. 1 over 1 minus x to the power alpha dx, right? 
right for alpha equal to 1 this integration will be 1 over 1 minus x dx because alpha equal to 1 now you can again substitute the variable 1 minus x is equal to y and you can rewrite this integration like this this is from 0 to 1 dy over y now what is this integration this gives you log of y right is that part clear yes sir yeah so this is just a general uh, standard formula that integration of dy over y will give you log of y now you can see here that log of 1 is defined this gives you 0 but ln of 0 is not defined this tends to minus infinity okay so since we are doing the integration from 0 to 1 and the lower bound is not defined then we can also say that for alpha equal to 1 this is not finite and i does not exist uh, i hope you are you have understood it yes, sir, thank you okay okay so thanks everyone for joining in today's class and uh, uh, we have already covered all the 10 questions so i will um, close this meeting for now and we'll meet in the next week next tuesday of next week and we'll discuss the problems of week six okay so thank you for joining and bye for now